Okay, great. Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to Talking the Walk, the complexity and nuance of cultural translation. My name is Gawa Desley, and I'm the development and admin coordinator at Powell Street Festival Society. Almost daily on my way to the office, I trace parts of the route of the 1907 anti-Asian riots. And I can't help but to think about my own racialized identity and its relationship to this place. I also reflect on the historical displacement and continued discrimination faced by indigenous peoples in the neighborhood. As a settler on the unceded lands of the Tsleil-Waututh, Musqueam and Squamish peoples, I strive to be accountable. During this talk, I invite you to reflect on how you, re on how you relate to the place where you are today and the language that you may have to make sense of this relationship. This series is in partnership with Dr. Sun Yat-sen Classical Chinese Garden with financial support from Canada, Canada Council for the Arts and BC Arts Council. And to everyone who has made donations to this event, thank you very much for your support. Some final notes before we start. We are recording this event and the recording will be made available on the Powell Street Festival Society YouTube channel. The speakers will be spotlighted throughout the presentations, so you do not need to change your viewing options. And lastly, we encourage you to write your comments and questions in the chat box throughout the talk as there will be a panelist Q&A towards the end. Now, allow me to introduce today's facilitator, Henry Jung, the creator of 360 Riot Walk. Henry is an artist and occasional curator whose projects explore the spatial politics of history, language, community, food, and cultural translation. He also teaches at Emily Carr University of Art and Design. Welcome, Henry. Thank you uh, very much, Gawa. Um, okay. And um, <clears throat> thanks everyone at Powell Street Festival who worked on the series of panels. I'm very excited by today's panel because of my own personal and professional interest in translation. I'm by no means a translator, nor do I consider myself a writer, even though I do write stuff. But I use language in my artistic practice and have in some projects explored how a particular meaning shifts when it undergoes the process of interpretation so that it can be represented in another linguistic and cultural context. I'm now going to attempt to share my keynote. Oh, and I guess I lose my screen at this point. Okay, I gotta switch, switch screens. Oh my gosh. Okay, sorry, I thought I had this all figured out. So um, <clears throat> there's the challenge of how to represent the past when our frames of reference, our values, our language today is a reflection of a specific contemporary awareness that has the advantage of hindsight. What does it take to understand how words were used generations ago when the meaning and use of the very same words have changed over time? What words and phrases were considered normal in the past that today are considered socially inappropriate or offensive? How many of the ways in which we express ourselves in current times will be considered inappropriate or offensive in the future? So how does one represent history in this case the 1907, why is this not moving forward? Oh, okay, I guess I'm doing that. Um, I'm sorry. Uh, so how does one represent history? In this case, the 1907 anti-Asian riots in Vancouver. For a 360 riot walk, so much relies on the script, which was a collaboration between myself and Michael Barnholden, Michael is the author of Reading the Riot Act, A Brief History of Riots in Vancouver, and had been giving riot walking tours for years. As we worked on the writing, he told me that since he last engaged in research for his book in 2005, more historical information had become accessible, partly due to more scholarly work done, but also the digitization of archival materials. And for this project, the theme wasn't riots in general, but rather anti-Asian racism in particular. The focus then was to contextualize the 1907 race riots within the history of white supremacy in Vancouver and its relationship to the West Coast, British Columbia, and Canada. The draft 
script was then given to Hain Wei, former president of the Chinese Canadian Historical Society, and Grace Eko Thompson, curator and founding director, curator of the Japanese Canadian National Museum, and Emiko Marita, executive director of Powell Street Festival for feedback. Their comments and suggestions were incorporated where possible, but we had to resist the temptation to include more references and related stories. The final English script was then translated into the three other main languages spoken in the area of the riots in 1907. Cantonese by Catherine Chan, Japanese by Yuri Hoyeyon, and Punjabi by Masha Kar. This was a whole project unto itself, but significant. It was important to include the linguistic and cultural backgrounds of those who were targeted by the white nationalists. And importantly, I wanted to make this project accessible to recent immigrants who might not be aware of this historic event and to reflect on what their lives might have been like if they had come to this part of the world in an earlier time. A fifth language was also included, Tahomish Snitchum or Squamish by Celia Joseph, which along with Hunkaminam is one of the two indigenous languages of the area. It's present in the first stop of each of the four soundtracks as it would have been at the time of early co settler colonial contact. The presence of all these languages is more than symbolic. They are functional. They, language is a technology developed by people as a way to communicate with each other, to share experiences with the potential to bridge differences. Each translator was supported by a proofreader slash editor who also attended the voiceover recordings. Taran Dillon for the Punjabi, Tarifumi Tamura for the Japanese, and Debbie Zhang for the Cantonese, and Charlene George for Celia Joseph. Since I am illiterate in these languages, uh, with, the only, with only some verbal understanding of Cantonese, these proofreaders played a crucial role in providing feedback to the translators and to check that what was being spoken sounded right. The exception was a Squamish recording, but Celia's recording was relatively brief and we did lots of versions to her satisfaction. I wish I had recorded the conversations between the translators and their editors before and during each recording. So much energy went into considering what an appropriate context would be in choosing specific words and phrases, because is, if something has meaning, then something is at stake. Then I edited the audio tracks, which is challenging because I didn't understand what was being said. Uh, the translators then proof listened and gave feedback and th that was incorporated. So this is the lead up to the panel. Our first speaker will be Yurie Hoyeyon. Yurie is a professional voice actress who has worked with over 1500 clients worldwide since 2017 and that calculates out to be like, how many clients a day? <laughs> That's a lot. Uh, she's currently voicing the Japanese dub version of the hit children's YouTube channel, Kids Diana Show, that has over 76 million subscribers, including its anime series. Uh, Yurie. Oh, let me get out of this thing. How do I get out of this thing? Oh my goodness. Okay, yeah, I think I took over. Okay. Yes. Uh, so may I start, Henry? Yeah. Hi, my name is Yuri Horyoyon. I was honored to do the translation for Japanese scripts as well as the voiceover in Japanese. As my process, as uh, Henry said, as my professional job is mainly voice actress, and I do a lot of localization from Heritage Canada, kind of academic, to online game, more like a regular talking like Japanese. So it was natural for me to take on this opportunity. When I translate, um, main focus for me is not the word-to-word -word translation, but focus on natural flow to Japanese culture. Today, I will share some of the specific words and paragraphs I encountered having tough time translating. 
And also at the end, I'd like to share a bit of a story of Komagata Maru. So let's begin. So this is the first thing came to my mind when I was asked to share what was the most challenging areas when I translated the script. It was really tough to translate, like always trying not to be one sided tone. When I think about it, whenever I think I got too one sided, me and Tadafumi, me and Tad always discuss and explain the detail to Henry and come up and came up with solutions. It was especially hard for me because the uh, when when it comes it, when it comes to the script about Japanese Canadian, as a new Japanese Canadian landed in Canada, it was heartbroken to know what had happened back then. Also, I got quite emotional to know the fact that Japanese Canadian was treated real bad by major population, especially by the government. Then my translation tend to become kind of accusing tones because I wanted to convey how serious it was back then to Japanese audiences. As it was not the, it was not the at all, because it, we never talk, actually we never learn this has happened in Japanese educational system. So that's why like, I really wanted to emphasize like, oh, this has happened, this has happened. But then like, when I translated, it actually had my one-sided feeling, like kind of accusing somebody. So it was not good because accusing is was not this project is all about. So I had to calm down and look over the script again and again and to make it to flat tone and only showcasing that fact. So that was the most difficult, but then also I care about when I translated this script. And also the, actually when I took on this uh, translation job, the very beginning was uh, actually one of the hardest part. Um, very difficult to translate in Japanese. I'd like to share how edit went. This. As you can see, there are so many reds. Like can English, like you see the uh, Japanese, like like cross lines and everything. And I will explain a little bit. So Tad and I edited this paragraph so many times together. For example, the very beginning part, um, the this one, this part, the bottom, this part. <laughs> This part is um it's it in Japanese it, it sounds like tsuan ni sakidachi gorikai itadakitai koto ga arimasu. In English, there was the sentence was beginning by simply please be aware. But we made it to prior to the tour, there are some things you need to understand. That's what we translated into Japanese. Since the word aware, like please be aware, aware was we thought too strong when it was translated in Japanese and it feels like it delivers a nuance of urgency and emergency, which would maybe lead to the danger zone feeling. But Tad and I talked about it and we didn't want to give a label of danger zone. So that's why we came up with this new write up for the beginning part so that Japanese people wouldn't label this area as a danger zone, but then like, they are allowed to know like, what's going on. And another part in this uh, paragraph, uh, higher density of vulnerable and marginalized part. First, I translated it as is, as shakai teki jaksha no mitsudo ka takai. But then we thought it sounded too straightforward and no compassion felt in Japanese. So we changed it to which means people who are socially and economically disadvantaged. The word to word translation don't work sometimes as is a literal translation, but it, it makes sense, like very straightforward. But to, to Tadafumi and I, like we thought like it sounded too academic. 
and you know, like no blood or no heart, no worms in it. So we thought we we all have to have compassion to understand each other in this modern world, and the translation has to deliver it. So that's what we did it, Tad, Tad and I. So it was quite difficult, but it was really, uh, we felt accomplished after we went through a lot of edits and we like what we have now. So next, next is, uh, I wanna share how to say First Nation words in Japanese. That was another thing we encountered that a little bit of difficulty. And I started some, some of the script has um, original indigenous languages and I don't, I didn't know how to pronounce. So I went online and searched Google and I found the proper uh, pro pronunciation. I will show you how it sounds. I have two video clips I refer to. And second one. Molly, Molly. So as you can hear, it's nowhere near Japanese pronunciation. So I made it into Japanese accent, so it will sound natural and flow in Japanese narration. It was really tough to find a mutual tone which won't lose too much of the original accent and pronunciations. So for this, I came up with the pronunciation. I will read after each one. So please listen. For this one, I said Sesunam. And other one? Molly. Molly. This one, I came up with Mare. So it's kind of close, but it sounds Japanese. So that's what we did. And sometimes we actually left the words as is in English. So because um, I will give you one example. It was the, the phrase called Asiatic Exclusion Leagues. We voice over it as Asiatic Exclusion Leagues, Asia Jin Hai Seki Renme. So we, we said both English and Japanese because we needed to do this. Like if we had only Japanese, then next phrases we cannot explain well. So that's why we sometimes leave the English as is, then put the uh, translation next to it. So for, for example, for Asiatic, like we needed to have this Asiatic word in it because the following sentence, uh, we're gonna we're gonna have more uh, translate. Uh, we're gonna have more uh, story going around the Asiatic, and then if we translate it completely to Japanese, and it's, it was it's gonna be really difficult to say it. And at the same time, we wanted to leave the uh, word Asiatic because Asiatic means Asiajin uh, in Japanese, but we wanted to reserve because Asiajin doesn't have anything associated, but then Asiatic that the word has association with all those cultural background or people, what they're thinking about and those things are actually in that word that we, well, uh, Tad and I felt. So we wanted to reserve the nuance when Asian people were called with that particular word and were categorized by that word. So I hope I have enough time. <laughs> Um, one minute left. Uh, this is gonna be my last story. And I wanna show you, I wanna share the uh, story of Komagata Maru. Um, now, the Komagata Maru is a ship name, the ship name. Uh, and then I will read the section from the script for your information. In 1908, South Asians were targeted from entering Canada through the continuous journey regulation, which was tested in 1914 by the attempted, attempted landing of the Komagata Maru carrying passengers from India who had stopped in Yokohama, Japan. So it was my first time learning that there was a ship called Komagata Maru to begin with from Japan and Indian people were on board. I never knew. After I translated this part, I went to the Mount Pleasant area 
to supply my goods to the store where my illustrated goods were sold. I actually have a different brand like uh, making a tote bag with my illustration and stuff. So I just went there and I put my stuff in. But then like, when I parked my car, then there was a mural going on. Like, and then uh, that was a Mount Pleasant area. And that was, I think, Main Street and East 10th Avenue. And back of the uh, the building, the called the Harry Stevens building. The name has like a issue too. I think they had to change the name. And I noticed the art style was indigenous flair. So I asked a lady who seemed like in charge of the whole art. And she started to talking about the story that the heart tribe helped Indian people when Komagata Maru had to anchor in the Cold Harbor for a long time, then sent back to India. Yes, so she was Moschium people of the river grass, whose symbolic icon is double-headed serpent. Serpent, and I will show you the uh, some of the uh, snapshot I took. Sorry, that was. This one, yes. I'll show you. Can you see the uh, like right here and then right there, double-headed serpent, and then another one that they are working on. And this color, specific color, was their tribe color. Very beautiful. And um, and also, uh, Emmy, can you maybe post the uh, link to the? Chat windows, I'll share the uh, the link. It was actually covered by the CBC News. So this is a picture I took from the CBC News and you can read all about it. And if I, I thought this, this was really a miracle happened to me because if I didn't translate the script, I would never ever know what she's talking about. Because of this project I took on, I could talk to her more. It was a moment that I felt that unfolded history was revealed in front of me. And now I am so happy to know more depths of the history of kindness Moschian people showed to the people who tried to land on Canada. It was certainly a great moment that highlighted my whole journey of the translation. And this concludes my presentation. Thank you very much. Arigato gozaimashita. Oh, um, yeah, I'd like to introduce Catherine Chan next, if that's okay. Can you all hear me? Yeah. So Catherine Chan is a former journalist in local print and uh, Chinese language uh, news media, including television, and has worked in Chinatown and uh, I mean around um, Chinatown for many years. She's a column writer, enjoys her current role in the communications and public engagement sector. Take it away, Catherine. Thank you, Henry. So uh, let me share. Um, yeah, so uh, my name is Catherine. And uh, like what Yuri shared, I also feel very honored and excited about joining this uh, Rywalk translation project. Uh, actually, we started it uh, two years ago, uh, the summer of 2019. Um, so uh, I was translating to the Cantonese Chinese. Um, so today I want to first talk about things I considered before I start translating it. Then I will share some um, cultural nuances that I encountered uh, that wasn't easy for me, but I find it very interesting. Um, so I remember when I first started, the first thing I asked myself was, um, how can I present this translation in a way that engages the audience? Um, so it can be most easy, easily understood in the native language, which is Cantonese Chinese. And to make sure the translation is accurate, um, also truthful to the script and preserve the tone of the original. And um, some terms in English don't exist in Chinese. So I just can translate them literally. And I was just trying to find a term that conveyed the meaning or the imagery as close as possible. And um, I also find very, interesting to do the audio um, and trying to find the appropriate tone and speed 
um, I find that the challenge for Cantonese Chinese is the way we write and the way we speak is a, is a little bit different. So I'm trying to make it um, not colloquial, too much too colloquial, a mix of formal and more um, speaking language. And um, I just find that maybe because of my background in journalism, when I translate it, I feel like I'm a reporter um, trying to visualize what has been happening and trying to report um, yeah, everything that's happening there. So um, let us all go to um, the um, Rye Rock tour, uh, start number eight. So, um, we will meet um, Yip Seng, who's the labor sharks. Um, so our Chinese workers were contract to labor sharks like Yip Seng. So he paid uh, the hack tax and travel expenses for these workers, but um, he paid a wage much lower than the white workers. And he withheld the monies owned until the debt was clear. And um, it depends on which period the workers come, but at a certain point, the amount of head tax is almost as, fans, ex as expensive as the price of a house at that time. So it seems like those workers, I don't know, maybe working for them for almost a lifelong, uh, I don't have those information there, but it's like exceedingly long period of time they're working um, to um, these labor sharks. And I guess this term labor sharks is also borrowed from the term loan shark in a way. So uh, in Chinese, uh, shark doesn't have the same cultural meaning in English. Um, well, on a side note, we know there's also shark in China as at that time, I think as early as the Song Dynasty in the 18th century, um, shark fin soup is considered as a very rare and luxurious cuisine by uh, some of the emperor. So this is just on a side note. Um, so as I couldn't find any direct substitute in Chinese for labor sharks, and I can just translate it as um, like a mean and greedy contractor, but I just find that it's too wasteful to let go of this vivid imagery of labor sharks. So um, I was thinking, and I, I do admit it's not easy. So I just try to find something as close as possible. So I use a big crocodile, dying off. So uh, in Ch Chinese, sometimes uh, we describe people as dying off. Uh, maybe more associated with money or finance, but in this case, um, um, I refer to someone who is ruthless, greedy, like Ipsang. And there's also a term called um, like uh, like someone uh, who swallow another person entirely without chewing the bones. It's, so it's like crocodiles. So it's how Ipsang appears to be, as he's helping the Chinese workers to pay for head tax and travel expenses. So he's uh, actually um, taking full advantage of these workers uh, to an extent, to an, like an enslaving level. So also to um, the same uh, paragraph, which also find it uh, interesting about how the labor sharks are making these Chinese workers indentured servants. So, um, I didn't translate um, the word, um, I didn't focus on the servants. Um, instead, I focused on the contract itself. So um, in Chinese, um, um, I guess ancient Chinese history, um, there is a con like contract binding one person to work for another person for a set period of time um, to an extent as if this person is selling themselves off. So I find, I try to find something like this kind of contract. Um, this one happens at uh, Han Feng Yilin. So it's around um, 18th century. Um, it doesn't specify what is this about, but it's just an example. Um, this is not any um, law abiding contract, but at that time people just honor it. So that is for slaves, um, sex trade workers, or even Chinese opera performance group. Um, because at that time, for uh, someone to join the Chinese opera is considered to be a very prestigious, prestigious job um, that uh, you can gain good money and uh, good reputation. So um, I translate that um, contract as my sun kai. 
um, is an unfair contract to the degree of enslaving a person because they need to survive and they lose their freedom. Yeah, so I think this uh, translation project has also um, um, helped me a lot in understanding more details about uh, what happened in 1907. And um, like this picture is from the stop number seven across from 122 Powell Street. And during that time, there's an anti-Asian riot in Chinatown. As you can see, um, there are lots of broken windows here. And these uh, stores uh, are owned by Chinese and Japanese merchants. Um, while the other stores beside it, the windows are not broken. Uh, they're owned by um, other races. So um, we can see that while nowadays, more than, more than two, uh, 100 years later, there's much racial equality in Vancouver. However, anti-Asian racism still exists and especially escalate, escalated by the pandemic. And for me, I think it's even more shocking to see what has happened in 1907 somehow repeated, even though um, the scale is much smaller, but um, these racism still exists. So this is a photo, um, uh, give credit to um, BIV Business in Vancouver. Um, this shows a picture of Chinatown during the pandemic quite recently, um, just um, an article from uh, last week showing how serious the graffiti issues in Chinatown and there's also a lot of uh, garbage, needles um, there. And why I say is resemble um, somehow to what happened in 1907, because um, a lot of the stores are uh, opened by Chinese merchants in Chinatown are also uh, vandalized uh, or they experience um, like arson and, and other, other issues. And all the other stores are uh, are spare as well. So this is um, like a modern version of um, anti-Asian racism. However, I, I still see hope in this. Um, here is uh, the stop uh, number seven uh, at the Shanghai Alley. Um, so this is a combination of what happened before um, or, or showing the artifacts before the hack tags, certificate and where the uh, Shanghai Alley is. Um, I think I see hope because even though we see a um, number of um, anti-Asian racism cases arise, um, like by 700% in Vancouver, and um, the pandemic has magnified this issue. But however, I see that as this is no longer hidden under the rug. Uh, people are more aware of it. And um, especially uh, having been in involved in this project, I can um, really appreciate um, Chinatown uh, even more. It's a place so rich in history. And this just reminds us not to take you over it again. Um, so um, yeah, I think by sharing with our friends, family, children, neighbors, coworkers, I just hope these uh, history um, as we understand more about it and hopefully that will raise awareness and direct us to a much more brighter, accepting, inclusive, and an equal uh, society. Yeah, thank you very much for uh, being here today and hearing my sharing. Thank you so much, Catherine. And, uh, and um, yeah, uh, next up is, is your bio somewhere here on my list, is Masha Carr who is a communications professional and a published author and translator working in English, Hindi, and Punjabi. Her writing draws inspiration from folklore and nature. Masha. Thank you so much, Henry. It's really wonderful to be here, to have been a part of the 360 Riot Walk project and to hear the other translators' experience. Um, it's amazing that we were all individually and separately uh, dealing with the same text. And yet um, we had probably slightly different perspectives. A lot of the times I see that the experiences overlap. Uh, for me, this translation um, 
doing the 360 right walk translation was, I would say, a really big learning experience. And it was a learning experience, both in terms of how one approaches translations and also a really big um, sort of lesson in history. Uh, some of the things that have happened in the past and they uh, just remain forgotten. But at times like this, when we um, approach things and throw some, throw some spotlight in them, uh, we think that we are able to um, uh, discuss, start a dialogue on some of the very important aspects of history like this uh, talk has done. Um, for my little brief talk today, um, I'm going to share what the major challenges that I found were when I approached this translation. Um, so uh, normally when I start a translation, uh, my first intent um, is to go over the script, whatever that may be. I have translated novels, I've translated poetry, more technical writing as well. But this was one of a kind translation that I, that I got a chance to do. So my first um, intent normally is to understand what the tone of the original writer is of the source text. And uh, when I started reading um, this script, I read it once, twice, three times. And I was trying to kind of um, pick out that tone so that I could uh, translate the tone as well while I was translating the content. Uh, but when I saw what the content of this uh, script was, I realized that in the case of this translation, um, what was more needed was for the translation not to have a very strong voice. It was important that um, the facts, the, uh, the story was told in a very objective way because these things have happened in the past and those experiences to some people are sensitive. They have grown over time, more and more layers of history have been added over them. And um, there's this new context of racism that people are experiencing today. So my aim was to send it out in a very objective manner so that the listener uh, of this um, script would be able to make their own opinion. So I tried to completely negate myself and I tried to negate any kind of emotion. I think that is another aspect that Yuri also touched upon uh, to completely remove yourself from the context so that you can just present the story as it is. And this was one of the first times that I had an experience translating in this way that uh, I completely forget who the author was, what the author's voice was. This, need, this text needs to go out in a very objective manner and let the person experiencing make their own experience with it. So uh, this was one of the first uh, challenges that I found and having understood the nature of the script uh, helped me start translating because it was a very delicate translation which would evoke emotions. There are um, so many aspects of racism. There are so many aspects that even relate to uh, the personal history of you can say my people where I come from Punjab. Uh, of of which there was a slight reference to the Komogara Maru incident, where a, a number of Sikhs had tried to come to Canada and were turned away. And, and they had a terrible experience when they reached in India as well. So um, to, just to try and remove yourself from it, um, this was a big challenge, but a great learning as well to negate yourself. Uh, the other really big challenge for me was that um, the, the target language that I was translating into Punjabi uh, does not have that kind of a historical and geographical context, um, which you know this script relates to. So, uh, so many of the you know references, like references to high tides and low tide, uh, references to fishing and all of those things, simply do not exist, you know, in the common jargon in Punjabi. Of course, we do have, you know, with over time, technical terms have been developed. But that is not something a listener would easily understand, you know, when they are going over that script. So um, that was another really big thing for me. Punjab, where this language is spoken, Punjabi is a landlocked uh, region. So we don't we we don't relate to the ocean. We don't relate to certain things like you know, uh, fish. We don't know the <laughs> names of fishes. There's there's certainly no translation for that. And um, of course, this is happening in a whole. All of this is happening in a whole other co continent where there are these issues of First Nations and there are issues of uh, um, um, you know, Europeans having gone there. Whereas these kind of um, 
you know, nuances probably were not a very integral part of the culture or the language in Punjabi. So um, inventing, I would say, new vocabulary in order to address um, this script was also a really big challenge for me. And um, very similar to, very close to this is another challenge that I'm going to talk about. The fact that the script was so dense with information, it was so dense with facts, so many different layers and nuances. So in every single sentence, you're not just giving a background. It, it grows from, it takes you from point A to B very quickly, and there is so much going on. There are um, uh, aspects of, like we've talked about before, there are aspects of racism and politics and religion and, you know, class and, you know, all of those differences. So much is coming together in one single sentence that uh, the, the sentences, are, I, I felt that they were too heavy. Like, how do I make them simple? It's, it's just becoming way too dense. But all of that information needs to be conveyed. And then there's the added challenge that the vocabulary, it does not exist in that language, which means that um, everything that I am conveying has to be descriptive. So the sentences are probably, they're running away from me. How do I keep them within that, you know? Um, how do I keep them tame and understandable? And um, very, very closely related to this was, was the final challenge that I'm going to share, was the fact that this translation was meant to be recorded. And for most part, it was meant to be heard by people rather than read. So all of this dense information with so many layers and nuances, uh, let's say somebody were reading it, they would get a chance to go back to it if they did not completely follow the idea. But here the challenge lies that somebody's listening. You don't want to disrupt their experience by having them go back, rewind and listen to it again. That completely destroys the whole experience. So these were the four really big challenges in front of me, how to make this really information rich uh, and very sensitive document easy to understand for, for the listener. So um, I understood these challenges and I think um, understanding what your challenges are and knowing them, acknowledging them is probably always the first step to approaching one's translation. And uh, once I had a clear understanding of um, what these uh, roadblocks for me were going to be, uh, the translations became a lot easier for me than when I first started. And I was a bit daunted by it, I, I must admit that. So um, it was a great learning experience. I learned so much about translations and learned so much about history. And at the same time, with so much of um, similar prejudices being seen even in the current day, um, more so during the pandemic, like Catherine mentioned, after this uh, translation was done, it just, you know, makes me realize how important it is for us not to forget and to have a discussion on, maybe not essentially always feel um, heard about it, but to, to use it as a lesson, to, to talk about these, these uh, things that happened in the past and use them as a learning for our future, because in some ways we are still struggling with the same problems that we did more than 100 years ago. So um, that's how, uh, that, that is what my journey with this uh, translation was. And it, I would say that it truly broadened my perspective as a translator. And um, I think um, made me a trans creator probably, you know, in, in true sense of the word. Thank you. Thank you, Masha. Thank you, everybody. Uh, that was really fantastic. I've got so many notes. Um, we're going to do a quick round of questions that uh, the, the the panelists have for each other, um, the, because uh, we haven't really had we've only had one opportunity before to converse amongst the well the the four of us together, and um, here's our second. Uh, because you get you all had a similar but different experience, and uh, I know you have some um, wonderings. Uh, like, uh, so yeah, let, let's start with, in the same order that we had before. Yurie, have you uh, figured out your question yet? Uh, audio. Sorry, it was more than the more than like a question than the um, I. 
I'm so happy that the, uh, after I heard both of you, the journey of translation, I was so happy that I actually took on a kind of similar and same journey. And that's actually amazing because we have totally different cultural background and total different languages. But like Masha, like everything Masha said was like totally, I was like, yes, yes, yes. Like, like jargon doesn't exist, but then like we have to come up. And then at the same time, like this is for the listening. So, we, and then this is information rich, but we have to have it like a simple language, but it's a sensitive issue. So, so many things going on. Um, so I, I actually don't have a question, but I just feel so close to like both of Masha and Catherine then that made my heart really warm. That's, that's what I have to say, I guess. Okay. Um, all right. Thanks. Thanks, uh, Catherine. I really resonate a lot on what Marsha and Yuria share, you know, about negating ourselves, how to do it objectively. And I think the audio part is, is quite challenging as well. And I know that like this time as I review the translation strip again, I also feel that I have learned so much and I, I can still put areas where I can improve, you know, I would say, oh, I should have done this better in certain ways. Um, yeah, but I'm also curious, like about, I mentioned about the, um, about uh, labor sharks. Um, yeah, I wonder how was this, how do you approach that for translation in Japanese and uh, Punjabi? Masha, and can I go first? Because mine is not that interesting. <laughs> the, I love how Catherine did it like a crocodile and then it has the actual kind of cultural meaning back of that translation. That was perfect. Like, but in Japanese, I couldn't find anything like that. And so I, 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 me and Tadahumi actually talked about it and then it came up with more like a simple regular wording. It's, it's not that much fun, but uh, we call it Hakengyo Sha. It's a, Hakengyo Sha is just a, the, not trafficking, but the, temp agency yeah just a regular temp agency but now i think about it because like catherine told me the question would be like this and now i think about it then i think i should have kind of applied some like um animal like, <laughs> like catherine did and then i was just thinking like what would it be and like maybe closest one could be the this guy i think i don't know I, it's called Kobanzame. Do you know this guy? <laughs> the, the guy who's like always stick himself underneath the big shark, like this. Like, lamprey, they're called lamprey. Lamprey? In English, lamprey. Yeah. Lamprey, like it could be like that. It's called Kobanzame. It's like a tiny, literal translation of Kobanzame is like a mini shark. But then I was thinking like, but the Catherine's one is so awesome because it com it conveys the those like unfairness to it, but not in a way of you know like putting your one sided opinion to it, but it's like broadly catch the meaning. And then like this Kobanzo is he's not that a bad bad of the guy, and like that made me think like mm, I should just think about more. <laughs> <laughs> to you, Masha. Um, yes, um, so I, I was not able to find a direct translation or anything to convey as a descriptive term for the contractor. So what I did was I described that the contractors uh, would uh, make the people, the, the laborers enter into contracts that were unfairly binding. So as, as a back translation, uh, that's, that's the approach I took for that. Great. Okay. Um, I mean, I, I think about the practices that um, um, are still going on today. Uh, and there, there are certainly um, uh, workers from the Punjab who are sponsored by a, a 
especially farms, you know, in the Fraser Valley. And um, some of those conditions are <clears throat> less fair than perhaps some other conditions, depending on who's bringing those folks over. And at the time uh, in 1907, there were boatloads full of Japanese workers um, about to come and work on the railways up north and in, uh, in different areas. So there are definitely these folks around. Um, and, um, and yeah, it, it's just, yeah, I mean, this project brings up so many questions to, to pursue further. And, um, um, but so, so, but I want to comment a little bit on um, Masha's comment about the density or the denseness of the information because um, in writing the script with Michael, it was always a concern in the back of my mind, uh, trying to be so concise and trying to fill every sentence um, so that every word actually had a need to be there. It was really spare, right? And I was afraid that from sentence to sentence and the next paragraph, you cover so much ground. There's so many references to other things that would be like full books or PhD thesis or whatever, that uh, how would someone who's standing on the street on the downtown east side, surrounded by the hubbub of the city and people and cars and all that stuff, how are they going to navigate this? How are they going to actually not just hear but process the information? It'd just be like overload. And I think it's, I think it's, uh, I think it's a, a huge challenge for anyone who does take the tour. Uh, and having led uh, these tours, the guided tours. Some of the participants, they stop looking at the imagery and they just close their eyes <laughs> to try to concentrate. Not suggesting that anyone do this, but I can understand why, um, because it's just so much information there. And it's not just about um, uh, just following the path of, of the mob that attacked Chinatown and Haurugai. Uh, because we're trying to refer to things that happened that led up to it and then things that happened since the ramifications. So uh, yeah, I, I kind of felt sorry for the three of you <laughs> to have to translate this. I think it's our pleasure to do this. Well, it was hard enough writing in the first place, but then to move it into another cultural context. Wow, so thank you so much for taking this on. Uh, so do we have any questions or comments from our um, audience? Would anyone have anything to say or share? Anybody we wonder We have a question about... from Steve Cross. Oh, great, okay, thanks. Oh, here we go. Uh, Steve, why don't you just uh, unmute yourself and chat with us? I have to speak. <laughs> I was so happy hiding. Uh, yeah, I, I'm wondering about uh, this has come up. Uh, Yuri at the beginning was mentioning the translation work we do, and um, this has come up, especially we're doing poetry, which is really short and brief. So, kind of the opposite of what you were doing, Henry. But this idea of the, the translation is it, it kind of its own thing in its own right it's a, a separate work rather than mm. it, just because of the impossibility of like I think when you translate you realize you can't just directly copy something like it isn't a copy and uh so Masha used the term uh trans creator which I love like you're not it, it gets at that you can't just get from there like you can't directly go from there to here there's there's some paraphrasing that has to happen somewhere to make sense and so I just wonder if that came up, like your sense of, uh, as translators of authorship, did you feel like what was being made uh, was yours? Did it feel like it was Henry's words and you were distanced from it? Or what was your relationship to the, the, final, uh, the final work? I'll call it work. I would say, um, well, I think we can all just have a, a short answer to that. 
uh, for me, like I said before, that I completely removed myself from the context. And that was the only way for me to do this most objectively. So I see it from a distance. Um, I see it not not as mine, but um, also at the same time, very proud that I was able to contribute. But uh, I've, I detached myself uh, from the text completely to be able to do it properly. Yuri or Catherine? Um, yeah, like me too. Like, but my way is um, I actually Google search for a lot of the uh, site script when, when I translate it because I wanted to know more what had happened. Like then I would know every, I feel like I would know more to translate that one sentence to come up with a perfect tone or nuance of it to see it as the uh, objective view. So first of all, yes, same as Masha, I try not to put myself in, but, and then, but at the same time, I, I cherish the English wording that, because there should be some meaning that you guys chose that wording and then the uh, sentence so that I cherish that sentence, but at the same time, try not to like, make it too simple in Japanese because it would lose the uh, cultural background or severe, uh, seriousness. And, but at the same time, I have to make it more casual. So balance was quite difficult, I would say. Kathleen. And I think I'm quite similar to you. Um, like, um, I, I said, I feel like when I'm translating it, I'm kind of like reporting this, like a new story or a history story to the audience. So trying to be subjective and let people determine based on um, the fact of what had happened. And um, yeah, and also for the audio part as well, make it easy to understand so people won't have to rethink again, because otherwise when they think thinking, then they will miss out what's the new information coming out. Okay, thanks. Um, do you want to follow up with anything, Steve, or is that okay? No, that's great. Thank you. I, 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 yeah, it's just uh, fascinating. I think some some work lends itself to, um, I think po poems lend themselves to existing as something as being separate, I think, because of the nature of poetry, where the work that you're translating that required that, that distance uh, it's, it's a different, I don't know, disposition toward it. It's, it's, it's just part of the endless, fascinating world of translation. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I think, I mean, I, I totally understand where uh, each of the translators are talking about in, in this relationship to the script, because in writing the English script, um, uh, Michael and I had this rather distant, um, distanced relationship to the events. And the issue is around representation, representing the, uh, the facts, uh, the limited information that we have to be able to represent the facts. Uh, the, the, uh, the scarcity of um, uh, written documentation in, uh, in Chinese and and um, Japanese and Punjabi, partly because uh, he and I don't read those languages and partly because uh, that documentation isn't re readily available. Uh, the lack of um, um, visual documentation in terms of handbills and posters that must have been covering Vancouver at the time to get people to come out to protest against the Asians coming into the province, right? I mean, that stuff was around, but we don't have any evidence of it. And in terms of photographs, we've got decent documentation of the damage in Gai area, but that's only because the consulate hired a photographer to document it all, to help them with the claims against uh, that for compensation. The Chinese side, I only know four photographs and they're all taken by Philip Timms of the Sun. It's the same four photographs over and over again. But it is it, it pales in comparison to the extensive document or, or systematic documentation in the Japanese Canadian area. 
So how do you navigate all this information and really the huge gaps that are missing? So yeah, there's a kind of burden of, uh, and the fear of mis, uh, burden of a representation and the fear of misrepresentation and all the missing parts that are in between. And uh, just putting that in words and going, okay, how far off are we here? Um, yeah, very, very uh, uh, unstable territory. And, and also not being a scholar in this area too, and just kind of like cobbling together the, the, and just, um, just fearing someone coming by and saying, oh, you're wrong. And okay, well, why don't we fix it? And what else do you know, please? And, and uh, for the people who are interested in understanding uh, you know, uh, how things are now in relationship to, to all the reasons in the past that take, have got, taken us here, the more that we can possibly unearth and share, the, the better, right? Um, and so this, so I'd like to uh, now bring up, uh, uh, okay, we have a few comments here. Aaron first, I guess, uh, wondering if Yuri, Catherine or Masha can speak a bit to how they imagine their translations will evolve with new reflections on how jargon or complex ideas can be conveyed in their languages. Do you imagine that the translations will change or stay set in stone long-term? So how long will your translations last for? <laughs> uh, it's a difficult question, but I hope my translation is gonna evolve for sure. <laughs> like, like that, I guess. I think even language is ever evolving, right? Um, yeah. As, as more cultures and more languages are exposed to new ideas, we start forming uh, terminology to express those ideas. Uh, like I said, you know, for, uh, for Punjabi language, um, you know, the experience of the ocean, it, it simply does not exist. But whenever there's some overlap of experience and we need to, we need the, um, there's a need to translate something, you know, related to that experience in Punjabi or when uh, Punjabi speaking people move out and experience a different thing that was not a part of their experience when living in their own land, they will develop, um, you know, terminology, they will develop expressions. And that's how translation evolves as well as language evolves. Translation also evolves with time for sure. Mm. And I feel that even during this pandemic, there have been a lot of new words coming out and included in the dictionary. <laughs> so maybe there will speed up the process of how, you know, our yeah. translation can set the test of time. So. Um, yeah, that's a very interesting question. Yeah. Yeah, I, I just realized I should have let Aaron ask her own question. <laughs> My apologies, Aaron. Next time. Uh, and we have a question or a comment from Angela, Angela May, uh, who is one of the speakers in the next panel uh, in on July seventh, uh, tenth. Angela, would you like to to ask it out loud? Yeah, sure. I can ask. Um, it's a bit long-winded here, so hopefully I can convey the, <laughs> the intent of my question, speaking it aloud a bit better. I'm just, I was noticing how you all re referred in different ways to removing yourself from the text that you were creating based on the original source text. Um, you talked about distance and um, detachment from the words that you were putting on the page, so to speak. And I think that's really fascinating because although it makes sense to me as a choice, given the, the, the job this time with translation, um, I think it's really fascinating because of course we wouldn't have any of these words had you not been, you know, been able to do all of this work of translation. So that's a really um, curious little like space, whatever that is in the, in the detachment and the distance. And I was just kind of wondering, you know, if you had anything uh, any stuff that didn't make the cut that maybe crossed your mind or felt like it was a big part of the process. Um, a couple of you refer to kind of difficult feelings like like so anger, um, learning histories that are really violent can be challenging emotionally. And I don't want to I don't want to ask this question in a way where it's sort of like, OK, like, tell me all of like the difficult things that you had to face going through this process. But I do think that it's relevant. Like, I think that's part of the work of translation sometimes. And um, you're also all connected in different ways to the kinds of violence that inspired these, uh, provoked 
these um, riots. So yeah, I was wondering about that distance and if there are things that felt important to the translation process but didn't end up surfacing in the final text that you produced. I don't mind going first on this. Um, I think the, the process of detaching oneself from a translation is mainly about not being emotional about um, whatever is being said. So basically just recording it and then letting the person, so that no judgment enters into it. So it's it's completely objective and then letting the person, you know, who is reading or listening to it, make their own opinion about it. So it's just about, and then that makes you conscious for with the choice of words that um, none of your words should be opinionated. They, they should be factual. Uh, that's, that's all it means for me to remove myself emotionally from the text. And same as Marsha, I think also um, about the tone that we um, convey the message. So it didn't mean that we cut out anything in the passage, because also we have to, um, I guess, be respectful, um, truthful to the original script. Yeah, basically saying as both of you, like, um, like sometimes when I translate in Japanese, like the first line, like I try to make sense in Japanese and then somehow, I don't know if it is only for Japanese uh, languages, but in Japanese language, you have to have some like sub quite subjective to make it more like a reachable to the people. Like if I make it more too objective, then it sounds too academic and doesn't come to like your heart. And then like, it's not casual at all. So I was kind of juggling around the sentence and then sometimes it makes perfect sense like um, in Japanese, but then now after that, like I look at, and then just like I shared my experience, they are sometimes like the, just a word aware, like little translation sounds too strong. And then I wouldn't even thought about it when I translated other thing. It just, I didn't have to put my carefulness to it. But this time I was quite careful because um, any like, even like one simple Japanese word I put in, like I feel like I was a representative of the cultural, of Japanese cultural cultures. And then I didn't wanna misinterpret from the original English text. So that, that was quite challenging, but I think I, me, like I couldn't do it by myself. Like I totally needed the tag. He had the objective eyes and then he sometimes pointed out, oh, you mean this? And then he changed the uh, translation into different Japanese and tell me, like, so you meant this? And then I, I was like, no, I didn't mean that. And then he goes, but it sounds like this. And I goes, okay, we should change it. And then that's how we translated together. I hope I answered your question. Yeah, no, I think it's uh, those answers were all great. I think it's partly a question about like translation itself and partly a question about this project in particular. So that's really, really great. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? Um, Debbie, Debbie, you had lots of experience throughout this entire project. You played a key role working with Catherine and the Cantonese. Hi, Catherine. I just wanted to say, I have, a, I have a, actually a language specific question. Uh, but before I do that, I wanted to comment on, um, on the loan charts and the crocodile. So when Kathleen first translated it, when I first saw the script, I thought it was so great because I thought that was one of the, when I read the English part, I thought that was one of the most difficult things to do is to come up with um, specific um, jargons or words that make sense in Cantonese. And the difficulty with Cantonese is that it's a dialect. So how do you make it um, approachable? Uh, so people, when people listen to it, it's more casual instead of like a long-winded um, essay. So I think uh, Kathleen did a great job <laughs> when I first had a look at it. So my question is actually for Marsha. So this uh, this week, I had a chance to um, edit some of, um, all, actually all three um, 
of uh, you guys uh, re recording of the script. So I picked something out from the um, from stop number 13. And what I realized is that uh, for the Punjabi version, and I don't speak, I don't know Punjabi at all. But what I realized when I was reading the script and I was trying to hear what Marsha was saying, despite I don't understand what it is, is I realized that there are a couple of words that you put it in English and it wasn't translated into Punjabi. So I'm curious, uh, but then when I was listening to what you're saying, uh, a lot of the words that I can actually understand it because it sounds like English. Um, so I'm just curious what, um, why specific word you have to put it in English? Um, the words that I'm referring to is Chinese Benevolent Society, uh, Association, sorry, Chinese uh, Benevolent Association. So that's one. And the, uh, and the um, Asiatic League, uh, the anti asian um, So that was another one, which uh, um, the, in the Japanese version, Yuri said that she also had a little bit of uh, thinking to do when you translated it. So I'm so curious about those two words. Some audio, Masha? Hear me? Yep. Yeah. Um, so I was saying that, you know, my approach usually to organization names, uh, like, you know, you just mentioned, is to keep them in the same language so that um, the listener or the reader is able to relate direct directly to them. So if we translate those names, then it's very hard to relate to what is being talked about and uh, to correlate them with other references of those organizations or proper names that might come uh, not just within this text, but also you know, in, in other texts related to this one. So that's the main, um, the, um, the idea behind uh, main, maintaining those. Just like we maintain other proper names, uh, the organizations need to be very quickly identified and never confused with people shouldn't have to wonder about you know what this might be really in English so um, that's why I maintain them as such yeah I found it interesting um, how the three of you uh, had different approaches to um, translating particular names or concepts because some of you like you know Yuri you talked about What's the what's the word? I, I know um, um, Chinese is sinicize is to make something Chinesey. Uh, maybe it's Cantonify for Cantonese. I don't know. Um, Punjabify, Japanicize. I don't know. Okay, so but you sort of Japanicized, Japaneseified. Yeah. Okay, whatever. Japaneseized. Jap oh my God. Okay, so you 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 took certain words, but you gave it a Japanese vocal verbal inflection, right? So it would fit within a Japanese sentence. It would sound Japanesey, Japanese mm -hmm. enough, mm -hmm. um, which is which is very different than code switching, which is what, in a sense, Masha, you were doing. You switched over to English, and you switched back, but you did it specific, consistently with names, right? So um, code switching, which is just literally moving between different languages. And it, it often happens within families where, you know, especially the kids speak more than one language and they'll just move in and out of two or three or four languages, depending on how many they have access to in the family home or with their friends or context. Um, yeah, I, I was curious for about the three of you, how you, whether or not you thought about code switching, or you, whether you were tempted to, because it's sort of an easy way out, right? And you don't have to translate it, you just use that and there were many opportunities to, especially since there were Cantonese words. There were, um, well, they weren't really Punjabi words, were there? Uh, they were uh, Japanese words. There were uh, Squamish words, uh, and obviously a lot of English words. So you could have just. And then there was the struggle to pronounce some of the, especially, not just the English but the other language words that you don't speak. So there was always this challenge of what do I do with these other specific name words? Mm -hmm. uh, can I go first? Yeah. Um, I think for Japanese culture, it's usually like 70% or more, like we have Japanese translated words for some historical events. So what I did when I translated this whole text was I, I Googled everything. Like, this might be 
saying something like that. And then if it doesn't come up from English to Japanese, I'm going to just search for the historical areas and uh, articles about that areas and then trying to find the, uh, the name, Japanese name already translated from the history back then. But some of the words are not just because it was not told, untold history. Then, then untold history in Japanese uh, history uh, was a difficult one. So I tend to go for English first and kind of translate it so that it makes sense. So that for people on the street don't have to Google it there. Like it makes sense to them. So that's what I did. And then like simplest thing I can say is like Dr. Sanyat is- like Dr. Sanyat Sen. Yeah, Dr. Sanyat Sen. His name is broadly known as Sonbu in Japanese. Hmm. Well, so I, I knew it from, because I learned it from educational system, I know it. But then I, I learned from the, uh, this time I learned the, uh, oh, his name, other alias was Nakata, Nakayama. His last name was Nakayama. That's why Nakayama Garden was equal to uh, Dr. Science and Garden. And then, then I, I, I was looking at that information. I went in and searched for more. And then I found out the, uh, Nakam I couldn't find a relationship between Dr. Science Sen and Nakayama. Like why, like he's Chinese, but how come he has Japanese last name? Then like I look for it and then I found out he was once in Japan and he got that uh, Nakayama name from the area he really liked. And then I was like, oh, okay, that's why. Then I would apply that translation saying like, I would say Sonbun and in pronounces like Dr. Science Sen or Nakayama or something like that, so. And for me, I find that when the words um, I can, there's no substitute in Chinese. And even um, if I, or for my so I can transcreate. So I think keeping original with some um, would make sense. For example, uh, the Kanakis um, Hawaiian uh, indigenous people. So I can only keep the regional. And I remember the part about the Pairu Grand or the Japanese, uh, the, the area. Um, so um, yeah, I think I would just keep the English one. Sometimes, for example, uh, I would keep the um, English translation, not Japanese, English translation, and then I will repeat the term in Chinese so that when people listen to the uh, voiceover, they will still understand, but they also know what the original is. Um, Masha, your sound is still off. Um, can I be heard? In, uh, am I, can you hear me now? You're on now. Okay. Um, I think there's a little lag from when I unmute. I was just saying that there's also a conscious decision one has to make as a translator, uh, that the, the target language we are translating into, the readers or listeners of that language, um, how much of English terminology can be introduced for them without uh, really disrupting the meaning of the entire text and uh, still maintaining some part of the integrity of the you know, English text so that the whole context is very, very clear. So that is a sensitivity that one needs to have, just how much of it can be retained as such or not. Thanks. Okay, we're, we're getting close to the end. I'd like to read something from Taran Dillon, who uh, worked with Masha on the Punjabi translation. He emailed a little statement uh, I'd like to share. He's, uh, he's unable to attend today because he's traveling. The opportunity to work on 360 Right Walk came as a surprise for me. Henry was looking for someone to help and Professor Anne Marie at UBC connected us. I learned a lot. I must admit that through this project, I became aware of the history of Vancouver, the city I call home. I learned that the relations between early immigrants from Asia and settlers of European ancestry were not always good in the past. I learned about the discrimination that the Asian community faced. I never could have imagined that this beautiful city was brimming with constant tension stoked by the Asiatic Exclusion League, resulting in the model tax on the Chinese Canadian and Japanese Canadian communities. That the city attempted to make people forget about that dark past by renaming numerous streets where the riots happened. A substantial number of Japanese Canadian, Chinese Canadian and Punjabi Canadian community members who came to this land in search of a better life 
fought for respect and equal opportunity. Their struggle and determination to provide for better life for their coming generations did indeed come true. All this makes me respect those brave people. I also learned that the pride, self-respect and equality that we take for granted today was earned by those who fought for it with determination. We should never forget those sacrifices, their struggles and their losses and victories. We should keep their stories alive. That is how we should thank them and honor them. I encourage everyone to attend the 360 Riot Walk tours this summer to learn more about the past, which is a great segue to speak about the five walking tours that will be led by um, uh, people not me, who are not me <laughs> for change, uh, starting um, on July 24th and 25th on that weekend, as well as the weekend after, and also on September 11th, which is the anniversary of the riots. The riots occurred the weekend after Labor, Labor Day. And, um, and also to invite you all, so those, those tickets will be made visible on Eventbrite on July 1st, but they, you won't be able to actually sign up for a ticket and get it, they're all free until July 10th, right after the next panel discussion on July 10th. Uh, and uh, what is the title of that? Uh, it is called What's at Stake, where the contributing writers for the 360 Right Walk website will speak to the breadth of significant issues and events that led to and resulted from the 1907 riots. So as I mentioned, Angela May, who is part of this uh, a participant today, uh, uh, attendee, whatever the term is, uh, and possibly Nicole uh, Yakshiro will be presenting Michael Barnholden, who I've talked about as a co scriptwriter, Melody Ma, a local uh, journalist and Chinatown activist, and Paul Engelsberg, who is an academic who has uh, done a lot of scholarly research on um, 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 South a early South Asian immigration, especially in the West Coast. They will be speaking about their um, uh, specific topics. So please tune in on July 10th. And I'd like to thank everyone for devoting their time on a, on a lovely Saturday weekend and to attend this. And thank you all. Thank you, Gawa. Thank you, Powell Street Festival. Thank you all very much. Howie. Bye all. Bye. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.